Mission is so intrinsically woven into our spiritual DNA that we can't help but display the good news of Jesus and declare the good news of Jesus wherever we live, work, learn, and play. Is that true of your life? Is that true of your words? And if not, I, I would invite you with, with, with a ton of humility, hear my heart in this, I would invite you to, to ask what other priority is shaping your life and your words more than God? Ready to jump in? All right, I'll take your silence from some of you as you need more coffee, then you're ready to jump in. But for the rest of us, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you want to open a Bible or pull up 2 Corinthians 5 in your app, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5. And we don't know each other, and so I'm supposed to start with a deep personal story or some witticism to help you get to know me. Uh, but instead, I'm going to start with a question that's about you. So here's the question. What would you say, if you were to think about this, just gut response, what, were you, what would you say are your top three or four priorities in your life? What are your top priorities in your life? Most of us would say family or job or school. We're in church, so of course we'd cross those out and put God at the top of it, at least for the morning, right? What are your priorities? But then I want to follow that up with a second question and ask you if someone had an all-access, no-holds-barred look at your time, at your finances, at your thought life, who, what would they say are your top couple priorities? I'm the new guy, so I get to make you uncomfortable today. Is it the same? Does it look different? Pro probably for a lot of us, it would be a mix, right? But we often think of, of priorities kind of the same way we think of New Year's resolutions. And we all know how those go. I saw a joke in early January of a child asking an adult, well, what is a New Year's resolution? And the adult said, oh, don't worry about it. It's just someone's to-do list for the first week of January. One week. And, and it's funny, we resonate because it's true for many of us. New Year's resolutions represent a, a best intention to do better, to, to start or stop doing something, some habit to, to, to change our behavior. To use the language we just used, New Year's resolutions are often about resetting goals or reordering our priorities. But you know why they often fail? It's because a lot of the ways we think about them are about the external. They're just focused on behavior. In, a, in other words, New Year's resolutions stop short of true change because where does true change start? It's not our external, it's not our actions. True change starts internally. Change starts with our heart. Even Jesus says this. He says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. As an overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so there's a phrase that we use in our own church a lot. We say, we say that who you are matters more than what you do. I'll say it again. Who you are matters more than what you do. Do you agree with that? Three of you do. Great. There's a second phrase, I hope by the end of the day, all of you agree that who you are matters more than what you do. There's a second phrase we use, though, a lot. We say, who you are overflows into what you do. Do you agree with that? All right, woo, resoundingly, okay. So that's true in general, that's true in, in all of life. Who you are, what's in your heart overflows into your actions, into what you do. And so if that's true in all of life, it's also true for the topic that I've been asked to discuss with you today which is mission. 
Who you are matters more than what you do in all of life. Who you are matters more than what you do as it relates to mission. What do you think of when you hear the word mission? Most folks, most Christians, just gut response, they picture a plane going somewhere, uh, whether overseas long-term or short-term, maybe some Instagram pictures from that trip. Maybe you think of a, a Saturday morning where you're serving your city somewhere. And, and for the record, those are good things. It's just not a full definition of mission. I love doxology. I've, I've had some really sweet moments with different people in your building. I've sat in this room for weddings and funerals. I have a deep affection for your church. And one of the things that I love most about doxology is how often and how well you beat the drum of everyday mission. You, you do it better than most many churches that I know, if I can commend you as a guest. Love where you live, neighboring, bless rhythms, thing, things like this are, are great. But even still, for many Christians, many followers of Jesus, mission is a thing to do. It's one checkbox on what feels like a, a never-ending list of priorities. Mission is an action. It, it, it's a specific time. We'll, we'll do mission for a few hours, then we'll do lunch at McAllister's. Then we'll do our kids' soccer game, but by April 15th, we have to do our taxes. Blech. Like it's, it's just one thing we have to do. It's about external things. It's behavioral when we talk about mission a lot. And so then, then what happens is we get busy and, and other priorities seem to take priority and we feel guilty or ashamed and so we hide from it. In other words, we, we treat mission like New Year's resolutions. And often, therefore, mission is just as effective as New Year's resolutions, which is to say it's not. We feel convicted, we think about it for a little bit, but then other priorities take over. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but is that true for you as you think about mission? This is why today's verses, today's passage from 2 Corinthians is really helpful as we think about mission because Paul is going to show us that, that mission is deeper than just something we do. Mission is, is intrinsically part of who we are. So read with me. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Here's what God writes through the Apostle Paul. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he, God, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's, what's the word? Ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Because God made him who had no sin be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Did you see it? Did you see where mission actually starts? The Apostle Paul, who for the record is called the greatest missionary in history, so he's credible. If you don't like what I have to say, got to listen to him. He shows us that mission is not just something Christians do. It's more than that. Mission is an overflow of who you are in Christ. This is the big idea for today. If you listen to nothing else, hear this. If you call yourself a Christian, God calls you his ambassador. Let me say it again. If you call yourself a Christian, God calls you his ambassador. We, we see this identity language starting in the very first verse we read, verse 17. If you are in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. A few different translations of the Bible will make it even stronger. They say, if anyone is in Christ, he is or she is a new creation. That's identity language. And I want to recognize not everyone here today is a follower of Jesus. And I want to thank you, if you're not, for, for being here. It's a, it's a bold thing to consider this. But everyone here, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, is driven by something or someone. We're all driven by something or someone. We all have one top motive, top goal, top aim. And if you're in Christ, then what Paul says, what God through Paul says is true of you, 
whether you live like it or not, is that your top motive, top goal, top aim is Jesus. That former story that shaped you, that guilt or shame or loneliness or anxiety or dissatisfaction, that's been removed. That's been replaced. What shapes your identity? What drives you instead? Verse 18 says it like this, God reconciled you to himself through Christ. Verse 19 says, God doesn't count your sin against you. He's reconciling the whole world to himself. If you're a Christian, do you believe that? That's your new identity. You are in Christ. But what do we do with that? If if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, my encouragement would be for you to ask, what is your identity? Who or what shapes your life? What is your top goal, priority, and motive? And is that thing a good king to you? Is it a good authority? Does it, does, does it or he or she or they keep the promises that they make to you? Do they satisfy? Or do you need to trade up? And if you're a follower of Jesus, I would ask you to consider, do you see that new identity, that better story as the true singular core of who you are? Or is Jesus just one priority among many? Because let me tell you a secret. Can I tell you a secret today? The concept of priorities, plural, has only existed since about 1940. Let me say it again. Plural priorities, the concept of plural priorities has only been around since, for, for less than 100 years. Do you know that? For all history before that, the word priority was only used in the singular. And by definition, and in truth, we can only have one single priority. The the Latin is, is prioritas. It means first. And guess what? You can't have multiple firsts. There's one first. I think that's part of why mission is so hard. I think it's part of why the Christian life is so hard for many of us, is it becomes one priority among many. Is that true? Hear me today. It is physically, emotionally, mentally, holistically impossible to be shaped by the identity that God says is true of you and concurrently be shaped by the identity that your boss says is true of you, or your child says is true of you, or your teacher, or your parent, or the desires that are against God say are true of you, or that your spouse says is true of you, or that your lack of a spouse says is true of you, or that some internal voice says is true of you, or some any other person or thing says is true of you. It's impossible to be shaped by what God says is true of you and what anything else says is true of you. Amen? Let's think of it from a different angle because this is a little bit heady. We all have different roles in life, right? We, and and so, so our roles in life is, is kind of like we all wear different, different hats. Um, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. I get to do some, some equipping and training uh, around the nation. Um, I'm a writer. I've gotten to be a professor at different points for different, uh, different universities. We all have different roles. We also all have identities, So I'm a husband, and I'm a dad, and I'm a brother, and I'm a son. Those those aren't just hats I put on and take off. Those are part of my identity statements. They're they're, they're more permanent. They're a little bit more like tattoos, if you want to think about that. They're permanent, and I know there's like tattoo removal processes. The metaphor breaks down, but I think you get what I'm talking about. They're permanent. They're part of me. No matter what role or hat I'm wearing... I'm always a dad. I'm always a husband. And and so just to be really ludicrous about it, Jess and my three kids, they're not here with me today, but I don't get to act as if I'm an unmarried man today just because they're not here. We'll be asking anyone out on dates. I can't stay here for the entire day without checking in with my wife to see how things are going. Like that, that would be ludicrous. Why? Because my identity shapes who I am all the time. It's always true. It overflows. Who I am overflows into what I do, into my actions, into my life, right? The the point 
is that similarly and in some ways even more so, in Christ, if that is my identity all the time, it's not just one hat among many. I don't put on my in Christ hat when I come in to church or Bible study and then take it off when I go to work or school. I don't, I don't put on in Christ for this relationship and take it off for that conversation. It's, it's who I am. It's always true. It's what overflows and shapes my life. Doxology, this is the good news of Jesus. In Christ, you have been made a new creation. That's your tattoo. That's your one priority. All the other identities and motives and goals and roles, they fade. Or at least they take a back seat to that one. You can only have one number one priority. You can only have one number one identity. And so, yes, other things exist. Job, family, school, work, play. Those are good. But each is rightly only seen through the lens of your first priority, your truest identity. You are in Christ. You're, that, that is the identity you take into every role. You, you're a beloved son or daughter of God. You have been reconciled and forgiven and restored and made new. Verse 21 says it like this, God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to become sin for us so that in Christ we might be reconciled, so that we might become the righteousness of God. If, you're, if you call yourself a Christian, that alone is the center of your heart. That is who you are. Is that good news? That, that, that's the gospel. That's the core of Christianity. And I want to zoom in for a moment because there's one more title. There's one more identity statement that God gives us. It's in verse 20. Do you see it? Because of Jesus' work, we therefore are, we said it together, Christ's ambassadors. What's an ambassador? It's a word that gets thrown around a lot. Most of us don't spend our days pondering that question, though. A common definition of an ambassador would be one sent, a man or woman sent from, from one nation or people to represent that nation or people in the midst of a different nation or people. Is that fair? It's an ambassador. You're sent from one nation or people to represent that nation or people in a different nation or people. That may be a, a, fair, a fair definition, but I want to consider a couple of additional truths. Because in addition to representing some nation or people... A second thing is true is that the ambassador is under someone else's authority. You're not just representing a nation or people, you're representing someone else. To be sent somewhere means there's necessarily a what? A sender. Someone tells you where to go. And if that's true, this third thing is also true. If you're an ambassador, you're given an assignment. You may be able to speak into it, that kind of stuff, but you don't get to be like, nah, I'm good. Because someone else's authority is sending you there. You're given an assignment. Are you following the image? Can we make the jump to what we're talking about today? A final thing about ambassadors that I want us to consider is that there is another assignment that people are given where they're a citizen of one nation living in another. You know what that other assignment is? It's a spy. I love spy books. Although the mystery and intrigue, it's great if you can weave a little humor in there. But a spy is different than an ambassador. Spies li live secret lives. They're, they're gleaning information. Ambassadors live overt lives, representing your nation and people and authority boldly in the foreign land. Does that make sense? So on one hand, we've already established you have a new identity. You, you are in Christ. You know how Paul talks about that in Philippians 3? He says you're a citizen of heaven. In Christ, you have a better kingdom. You have a truer home. You have a higher authority. 
On the other hand, I don't think I have to convince you, the, the world we live in increasingly looks different from the kingdom of heaven. It, it increasingly looks different from our true home, yes? But Jesus, our true king and our authority, sent us into this world. Maybe the, the weirdest prayer in all the Bible, there's some weird prayers in the Bible, but one of the weirdest at least, is a prayer that Jesus prays to the Lord, to his Father, for his disciples in John 17. And, and, and here's what he says. He asks his Father, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Then he says a couple verses later, still in his prayer, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. That's Jesus' prayer. Don't take him out of the world. He recognizes that there's evil and darkness and asks God to protect us. But, but then Jesus prays that the Father would send us into the world. And the book of Acts shows God's initial answer. Jesus' initial disciples live on assignment. And what's true of Jesus' first disciples, at least in this instance, is also true for us today. If you call yourself a Christian, God calls you his ambassador. So think for a moment. Do you, do you live your life more as a spy a citizen of, of heaven living secretly in the world today? Or, or do you live your life more as God's ambassador? Is your true identity a secret? Are you hiding your number one priority? Or do you boldly represent the kingdom of God and display and declare the good news of Jesus and invite people to come back with you to your true home and theirs? Do you get this? We don't just do mission. We are ambassadors. You are a missionary. Again, what, what is in your heart comes out of your mouth. It overflows into your life. Our identities overflow into our action. Who we are matters more than what we do. Here's the image that Paul's painting in these verses. Is that mission is so intrinsically woven into our spiritual DNA that we can't help but display the good news of Jesus and declare the good news of Jesus wherever we live, work, learn, and play. Is that true of your life? Is that true of your words? And if not, I, I would invite you with, with, with a ton of humility, hear my heart in this, I would invite you to, to ask what other priority is shaping your life and your words more than God? Who is your truest identity, your number one priority? So this is theory, this is theology, this is explaining what the Bible says. What does this look like in real life? I'm going to give you a general answer and some specific examples. In general, here's what it can look like. Many of you in the room go to work or have some job, but your identity is not shaped by a boss or employees. Your number one priority there, and, and stick with me, your number one priority there isn't even this deadline or that job task. Your number one identity and role and priority at work is knowing that God sovereignly and lovingly sent you as his ambassador to that company, that role, this moment, to winsomely and humbly display and declare the good news of Jesus there. Or... You attend a specific school, or you live in a specific neighborhood, or you've been put amidst specific family members and friends and neighbors, not just out of some happenstance or logic or logistics, but because God sovereignly and lovingly sent you to be an ambassador to that school, this neighborhood, these people. You are there primarily because... God sent you to display and declare the good news of Jesus. 
I was in a group discussion uh, a few years ago, and many of you are in Bible studies or, or small groups or this kind of stuff, and we were talking about Acts 9, which Acts 9 is the, the calling of Paul, um, where, where Paul uh, goes blind and hears this voice saying, Saul, who are you persecuting me? Uh, and then Jesus tells him, go to the street called Straight, which is like go to Straight, like go to Hewlin Street, basically. Um, now, that, that text is not overtly about missions or being an ambassador, but there was a college senior who was part of that group, and he's been really thoughtful, and, and God brought to mind this concept of missions. And Gabe said, he said, I wish God were being that clear with me of where he wants to send me on mission, to, to use today's language. But Gabe, was, Gabe was asking that God would be cl that clear of knowing where his assignment was, where he was supposed to be an ambassador. And you've been in those rooms, so you know the right response. When someone says something really deep, you're supposed to go, mm, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. So we did. Appropriate response. Except for one freshman girl. And she said, well, hasn't God already been that clear with you? And, and Gabe said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, where do you live? And he said, well, I live on Hurley Avenue. She said, well, why? He said, because the, the rent was cheap. It's not anymore, but it was like several years ago. So... Um, Rent was cheap. It's, it's where my roommate found a place. And, and on and on this conversation went. And the point that she was making was to say, and a lot of us still believe this, we talk about God's sovereignty and love over here, but then we live our regular lives over here. But if what we believe is true, then it is always true. If God is sovereign and loving, then you have a specific home and a specific job and a specific school and a specific hobby and a specific set of friends and family and on and on and on we could go. Why? For God's purposes. For me, I, I wanted to move to Colorado after college. Anyone who grew up in Texas wanted to move to Colorado. It's part of what we do. And things kept not working out at the grad school that I was applying to in Denver. But everything kept working out for me to move to Fort Worth. So I could say logically and from a human perspective, the reasons that I live in Fort Worth were a job, grad school, scholarship to that grad school, a free place to live, and oh yeah, I was dating a girl who was going to Baylor who I really wanted to marry one day and did. That's, that's the human perspective of why I'm here. But if I really believe the things that we say we believe, that God is sovereign and loving, then in truth, I'm here because God wanted me here. I'm here because God sent me as, as his ambassador to live my daily life in Fort Worth, Texas through a, the lens of my truest identity and to display and declare the good news of Jesus where I live, work, learn, and play. There's, there's what it can look like in general, but guess what? I'm, I'm not super special. The same thing that is true for me, that was true for the Apostle Paul, that was true for St. Patrick, that was true for anyone who's lived on mission at any point in history is also true for you. So what can that look like more specifically? I'm, I'm not going to punt here, but I do need to say, this is where the Spirit of God and your freedom in Christ immediately comes into play. Because there's a million ways that you can display and declare the gospel of Jesus to the people that God's put you in the midst of. Here, here's just a few. Uh, my friend Anne is an accountant. Any accountants in the room? I can't see anyway. It's okay. Um, she was getting to know her, her coworker, and, and over time, she ended up sharing the good news of Jesus through the lens of their shared work. Now, Anne was an auditor, and so they would go into a company, and the books were broken and needed to be made right. And so you know what Anne and her company would do? You know what the word is? They would reconcile the books. What a, like, deeply spiritual... <laughs> thing that you accountants do. Well done. <laughs> and without context, that may sound a little bit cheesy, but I just summarized like two years of a relationship in, in 45 seconds, but, but, but it's true. And so she was able to see the, the reconciling of books as a way to point to the reconciling of the world. Uh, my friend Matt is intentional when he goes on work trips. He travels for, for work. Um, he's intentional to hang out with his colleagues and those that they're meeting in, in the hotel bar. And he'll truly get to know them outside of the work conversations. And at times he's had the opportunity to pray and share better news and, and a picture of a better story than the story that some of his colleagues were living. 
um, Gary Foran, who you know, uh, shared on the same topic last week at your Alliance Church. Um, and, and so there's also a few examples of what this can look like from, from your church family, from amidst doxology. Uh, there's one couple that shared a story that, that, that they have get-togethers and neighborhood block parties, and probably many of you do this. And this one person who shared said that they've invited both believers and non-believing neighbors. Why? Because we're not pursuing folks as projects. We're, we're loving people because they're people that God's put us in the midst of. And so believers and non-believers became part of this really strong neighborhood community and became good friends together and would share struggles and would receive help and would receive prayer in the name of Jesus into some of their needs. A sixth grader, sixth grader, one of your own students here at Doxology felt compelled to talk about Jesus with a specific friend. Um, it was based on a bridge diagram that she learned in student ministry here. And she was nervous and talked with her parents a few times, but then she shared the gospel with her friend at lunch. Good job, sixth grader, for the record. That's bold. She discovered that her friend had recently become a Christian, but her friend was so happy to know that there was another Christian at her school. Um, one woman who's part of doxology invests in relationships with parents of her daughter's volleyball team. Another is connecting with a neighbor she met at a Pilates class at a neighborhood park. And as another example, I've been in this room when a grieving widow shared the gospel at her husband's funeral. Uh, my friend Valentine and his wife um, went through the adoption process. They were, they were adopting a baby. Um, my wife and I get to do some foster care work as well, so we got to know them and their story through this. And they uh, had this image of, of getting to, to share the gospel with their caseworker. And so their caseworker at one point said, why? Why are you doing this? The baby they got paired with was so laced with drugs and the mom had been beaten so badly that the, the baby came out early. And so they were looking at months of NICU stays and visits and, and the, the caseworker said, why this one? And there's a moment there, and we have these moments. They're like, we could have taken the safe way out. Said, so, well, we've been on the list for a long time. We don't know when there's going to be another. But, but Valentine said in that moment he felt like this is an opportunity, this is an open door. Valentine had come to Jesus in prison when he was in his, his late teens, early 20s. And so he said, we're followers of Jesus. When I look at this baby in all of its brokenness, I'm reminded of who I was. In, in a deep state of brokenness, and yet Jesus came and pursued me. And we want to reflect some of that same love by pursuing this baby in all of its brokenness. And the caseworker says, I've never heard something like that before. And so far as I know, the caseworker didn't come to Jesus that day, didn't fall on her knees and start crying, but, but that's not the point. The point is that they felt like they were being compelled to walk through an open door, and they did. For me, I taught at TCU for five years while we were planting a church, and, and I wasn't allowed, per today's conversation, to take off my identity in Christ hat when I walked on campus and put on my professor hat, which would look a lot like the Harry Potter teachers. Um, and so I diligently did my job. I taught public speaking. But more than that, I saw myself as God's ambassador, and he sent me to 50-plus to students every spring and every fall who wouldn't come to doxology or my new church plant or, or, or any other. And over the semester, we build relationships and I had opportunities to pray and, and show grace and, yeah, at times got to know folks and, and share the good news of Jesus. All of this, I hope what you're hearing is all just pieces of everyday life. It, it starts with simply seeing people that we know and places that we live and work and learn and play through the lens of our first identity, which is in Christ. We are ambassadors. We are sent by God. We are on assignment. Th those are examples from other lives. What about yours? What could it look like for you to live on assignment, to display the good news of Jesus as his ambassador wherever you w live and work and learn and play? What need do the people around you have that Jesus alone is the truest answer to? How could you declare the good news of Jesus into every problem and issue and sin and brokenness that you see? And, and I, I want to close with, with one last question. If you are a follower of Jesus, 
who was influential in your faith and in your coming to Jesus? Because that person or, or those people, they also were God's ambassadors. And they said yes to their assignment to you. If you follow Jesus, there's a solid chance that you're in this room because of a long line of ambassadors who accepted their God-given assignments. Paul was assigned by God as an ambassador to the Greek and Roman world. St. Patrick was assigned by God to represent him in Ireland. You are a Christian because someone or someone's accepted their assignment to your city, to your household, to your specific life. Salvation is of the Lord. It's a mantra throughout the scriptures. Our charge, our commission is to make disciples. God doesn't give us a quota. Praise God for that. But by his spirit, God empowers and calls us to join his mission and his reconciling of the world. Why do we pursue mission? Because who we are shapes what we do. Because God reconciled you and gave you the ministry and message of reconciliation. If you're in Christ, you have a better story, you are a new creation, and you live, work, learn, and play, and you have relationships in specific places and at specific times, because that's your assignment. That's your number one singular right priority. That's the truest identity that God has given you. The world needs the good news of Jesus. What's your priority? Will you live out your truest identity? Will you live on assignment? Because again, if you call yourself a Christian, God calls you his ambassador. Can we pray? Father, we can believe these things to be true. And then as soon as we walk out of here, it feels like a million other things can take our take our hearts, take our minds, take our souls. Um, I pray that you would, by your power, do what only you can accomplish and help us believe these things, but also help by your spirit, help us live out of them. Help the truth of our identity become an overflow into our lives. Would you help us to, to have this new lens of where we've been sent, who we've been sent to? Would you, by your spirit, help us live out our identity every day? We can't do it alone. We need you. Amen? Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.